This time, a shop explodes. I remember one lady saying that she thought it was a bomb. She thought it had been a terror attack. Five people die, but the owner survives. I just heard a big bang. I see from everywhere fire, like I am inside the hill. The Watcher. He's prepared a story, and he's presenting it with so much emphasis. His behavior tells us he's a killer. The Listener. I need to get, get, get self myself into the safe place. He's indicating to us via this verbal slip that there was her place he was meant to get himself to. And the profiler. It's incredibly cold, it's incredibly calculated. You've got three men who must have a real disregard for human life. And later. This wouldn't have been unlike any other day for Peter Wrighton. But out of nowhere, a fatal attack. Can you explain to me why your DNA is on that man? I can't knowing. We see the hand shrug and we see a head gesture, no, micro gesture, no. Why is your DNA on him? He was there and he killed him. A deafening explosion. and a devastating blaze. Leicester, on the night of February the 25th, 2018. 50 foot flames engulf a convenience store. Firefighters tried desperately to stop them spreading. It took a long time for the emergency services to get that fire under control. And when the helicopters flew above the shop, it looked like a tooth that was missing from a row of teeth. There was nothing left. The building had just imploded, and all you could see was this void, this empty space, and just rubble everywhere. And you could just see some of the firefighters with their brightly colored hats popping out amongst the rubble. And it really was like a war zone. Five people die. Care worker Mary Raguba, who lived in the flat above the shop. Her teenage sons, Sean and Shane, and his 18-year-old girlfriend, Leah Reek. The fifth victim is Victoria Lyavleva, who'd been working in the shop itself. One rumor was that it was a gas explosion. I remember one lady saying that she thought it was a bomb. She thought it'd been a terror attack. It's difficult to believe anyone could have survived. Is there anyone in this building? Hello? But one man has. You are, my friend. Aram Kurd, aged 34, the owner, says he escaped from the storeroom at the back of the shop, but he's too shaken to give details. Just, just go through then what, how it all come about. I don't want to cook, I've No, OK. No, OK. He was bleeding from the head. He was clearly distraught. It looks completely believable. able to say, look, look, see what I've got, look at the back of my head, look at my leg. And it gave his story a level of credibility. Although when you look more closely at it, could he have been in the storeroom at the time that the shop went up? He couldn't possibly have been. A day later, his store in ruins, Kurd is visited by a BBC news crew. He was shaking, he was visibly very upset. He kept looking to the ground. So just tell me, you were in the shop. Yes. Can you describe what happened? I was in the shop with my staff, Victoria. And then we was watching uh, together in YouTube. For the moment, I said, I go, I go to bring some beers in a storeroom. And I go to the storeroom with her phone in my hand because we was watching together from her phone. My phone was on the charger. And then I go there, storeroom is next, belongs to my shop together. Mm. I mean, there's a steps, you're going a little down. 
And I couldn't reach the beers. I just heard a big bang. I didn't know what was that, and I found myself on the floor, eyes open, looking up, and I see from everywhere fire, like I am inside the hill. When you are a reporter and a news team, um, you are very cynical, and lots of questions do go around in your head. So we did talk about whether there was something he wasn't telling us or whether he was being 100% truthful. In fact, the signs of deception were there from Kurd's very first sentence. So what we've just seen is what um, we call a, a blink sandwich. So if I take this back, we get some rapid blinking, maybe 10 blinks there in one second, which is a signal of cognitive load. I was in the shop with my staff, Victoria, and then we was watching uh, together in YouTube. So he's thinking hard. We was watching uh, together in YouTube. And uh, he's maintained an eye contact without blinking as he's making that statement and trying to convince it to be true. And then at the end of the statement, there's a compensatory effect that we term it, where he recovers with rapid blinking. If you get a combination of rapid blinking, statement, rapid blinking, the statement in the middle is very often a lie. To reinforce the theory that this statement is a lie, and what we see at the end of the sentence is a micro head shake, no, back and forward three or four times. It's only a little less than a centimetre if you measure the tip of his nose, but this contradicts the positive statement that I was watching YouTube with Victoria. I very much doubt it. There were already doubts about Kurd's story. After firefighters put out the flames, their forensic colleagues got to work. They went in and amongst the rubble in the basement. What they found was that petrol had in fact been spread all around that area with an accelerant, something that would make it go off. It was now clear the fire was started deliberately. And as Kurd was the one person with unrestricted 24-hour access to the building, he was under suspicion. So who was the man who had bought the store just over a year earlier? Aaron Kurd was a guy who had come over from uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. And he'd been in this country actually for a number of years and tried to set himself up as a businessman. He was ambitious. He wanted to make money. He found a shop, actually, that was up for lease in Leicester. He completely refurbished the shop from scratch. So to anyone from the outside looking at what Aram Kurd was doing, the impression they'd get is that he's actually serious about running this as a grocery and off-license. Just three weeks earlier, the store had been insured, not by Kurd himself, but by two friends, Arkan Ali, and Hawker Hassan. The insurance that was taken out was done in very strange circumstances. They went about looking for insurance from places not in Leicester, but elsewhere. And they tried and they failed. And some of the insurers were a bit suspicious about this. Eventually, they got an insurance policy up and running. If the shop and its contents were destroyed, the policyholders could receive £300,000. Clearly, this is an insurance scam, isn't it? The shop went up like a bomb had gone off. How he escaped with his own life, I've got no idea whatsoever. Greed does very strange things to people. I know this, but Kurd knew that a family, a whole family lived above his shop and he didn't take any care at all to find out whether they would be there or whether they would be hurt or not. So that's a degree of recklessness, but also a degree of callousness. But soon, police discovered this CCTV from the day before the blast. Hawker Hassan buying petrol from a local garage, filling a container with more than 26 litres 
and putting it in the car. Every effort had been made to disguise what they were up to, but the CCTV betrayed the truth. Next, the canister is switched to Aram Kurd's car. On the edge of frame, the boot opens, the canister is taken out and carried inside the shop. The CCTV showed Ali going round the back of the shop. It showed Ali actually trying to divert a camera from a neighboring building because he didn't want anything to be caught on camera. But across Leicester, in the hours leading up to the blast, other CCTV cameras had recorded the gang's preparations. Coming up, the watcher, the listener, the profiler, and the tapes that tell the truth. He's got a plausible story, but his behavior tells us he's a killer. February 2018, a fireball destroys Aram Kerr's convenience store near Leicester city center. Five people have been killed, but somehow he's escaped. I am in a shock. I am in a shock. I don't know what to do. I am in a shock. But then, two major police discoveries. First, the shop was recently insured. Second, Kurd and his friends bought petrol shortly before the explosion. My name is Aram Kurd. My date of birth is 21st March 1984. Thank you. After the blast, Kurd is interviewed by police. I just heard bang. Mm -hmm. Bang. He's prepared a story and he's presenting it with so much emphasis, with uh, and a leaning forward of the body. So if the facts are your friend, you just convey your story. If you're telling a lie, you need to convince the interviewer that what you're saying is the truth. And unfortunately, perpetrators get this wrong. They think the best way to convince someone is to force and push the story past them, to lean in towards them, and to illustrate and exaggerate the movements. Unfortunately, those are indicators of deception because truth tellers don't do that. And if we look at the video in uh, fast forward, you'll see the extent of the gestures. It's almost comical. He sees forwards on the edge of his seat, he's leaning, he's, he can't get any nearer to her without leaving the chair. He's trying to convince the officer that all he did was go into the back of the building and there was an explosion and it was nothing to do with him. But when he's describing his purpose and going to the, uh, the back room, uh, we see an interesting piece of behaviour. Uh, just watch his left shoulder, so it's on our right. Mm -hmm. And I go there. I want to pick up some beer. A single-sided shoulder shrug. This means I have no confidence, or I don't know, in terms of what I'm just talking about or saying. And if you do that as a big gesture, it's probably intended to be seen by other people. But when it leaks, especially from one shoulder, or when it's only a centimetre or less, it's usually the case that the sender of that information isn't aware that they're moving their shoulders but we can see it from the outside. So we now have information that the claim of his intent and purpose for going to the back of the house and the shop uh, isn't to just go and get beer. Among the dead, a family who lived in the upstairs flat. Is there anyone in this building? Hello? Kurd has suffered only minor cuts and bruises. Yeah, my friend. Man, I was lucky. I was lucky. But I, I am lucky, I tell you. Why had he been so lucky? He uses one small but highly significant word. Four minutes into the police interview, he's explaining that he's, he's pressing the phone to get the lights to come on. I just press, like, a little bit light coming. I look where I am because I need to get, get, get self, myself into the safe place. Because I need to get myself 
into the, the safe place. The difference between um, the and a is the is, we say the when we know something. The safe place suggests a known place. It seems to be possible that he's indicating to us via this verbal slip that there was her place he was meant to get himself to, a known place where he could be safe because of what was coming next. Kurd also betrays himself when talking about his assistant, Victoria Lyavleva, who died in the fire. And what do you know about Victoria? Nothing. She just started yesterday. Yeah. Like, before yesterday. Mm -hmm. Do you know her surname? No. Did she tell you where she was living? No. But then, a very different picture emerges. Um, so you went out to the story, but you said that when you did so, you were still holding Victoria's phone. Because we, for the moment, we was watching YouTube, uh -huh. and I said, okay, like, like you know, like joke way. Okay, I'm going to have some some beer, and I hold in the phone. Okay. And I go with the phone. So you took her phone out the back. Yes, and as she a was bit of a joke. Yeah, saying, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go because, watch this. Because it's normal. Yeah. For us, it's normal like that. I don't know. It's normal uh, for us. It's normal like that. So it's a revealing self-disclosure for me, um, not least because Kurd has been at pains to point out that he doesn't have a close relationship or indeed any relationship with Victoria because he hardly knew her. So why would they have a normal? Because it's normal. You have normal with your partner. You have normal with your kids. You have normal with your friends. You, you don't have normal with someone who only started two days ago. For us, it's normal like that. I don't know. I think this is him slipping up. This is fabricated. Soon, the full extent of the fabrication would become clear. Police discovered that Victoria had been the girlfriend of Kurt's associate, Arkan Ali, for five years. She'd been with him when he and Hawker Hassan had taken out insurance on Kurt's shop and was in the car when Hassan bought the petrol that caused the blast. Victoria was undoubtedly very useful to this gang. She would help them to get the insurance. Her English was good enough for her to talk to insurance companies and say that they needed cover for the shop. But of course, what that woman didn't realize was that the other three men had different designs. The other three men had already made a decision that she had to go. They were worried that she might squeal to the police and perhaps also because they thought that they could share the proceeds of their endeavors amongst themselves without having to give any of it to her. So, this is not just an insurance scam that's gone wrong. This is a murder plot. They decided that they were going to get rid of Victoria because they didn't want her to bite into the profit, the £300,000 profit that they were hoping to make on the insurance. It's a, a disgusting misuse, isn't it, of a woman and it's viewing her as a commodity rather than as a person. CCTV footage of the day showed Victoria arriving at the shop alone. At the same time, Kurd, Ali and Hassan met at a city centre cafe, taking an hour and a half to finalise their plan. This was the activity of men who knew exactly what they were going to do. At 6.55 p.m., Kurd stands at the shop entrance, glances down the neighboring street, then goes back inside. Meanwhile, Ali, carrying a torch, enters the building from the back. One minute later, he emerges and is immediately whisked away in Hassan's Audi. Seconds later, Kurd takes Victoria's phone, receives his warning and escapes. Victoria was left in the front of the shop, unsuspecting, completely oblivious as to what was about to happen. Perhaps she thought that a fire would be set and she'd be given a warning to run out. She wasn't. She was left there. With flames lighting up the backyard, CCTV captured Kurt leaving and climbing to safety. Have you been able to contact her since? Do you know how she is? Though he knew she was dead, 
Kurd used his TV interviews to pray for Victoria's safety. So I don't know. I really hope that she's alive. This is the, uh, the, the prayer gesture showing concern. And if I activate the video note, you'll see him quickly move into her and the inward take a breath and the wide eyes. Uh, wide eyes are a, a quite a good, reliable indicator of either surprise or fear. In this case, I believe it to be fear. And why is Kurd fearful? Because he killed her. As detectives couldn't prove the gang intended to kill their victims, they charged Kurd, Ali and Hassan with manslaughter. But then came a surprising development. While Kurd was remanded in custody, he actually told an inmate that he had planned this fire. He said that he wanted to kill as many people as possible because if he did that, he believed he would get a larger amount of money from the insurance company. In November 2018, Kurd and his two accomplices pleaded not guilty at Leicester Crown Court, but the jury delivered a clear verdict on the five charges of murder. It rang through that room. Guilty, 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 guilty. Kurd and Ali got life with a minimum of 38 years. Hassan, life and a minimum of 33 years. Now they sit in a prison, serving huge sentences, which would mean that really there's nothing for them to come out to. And all for what? For a few hundred thousand pounds on an insurance claim? What a complete waste for them, but what a waste of life for those who perished. This is a story about greed. It's incredibly cold, it's incredibly calculated. You've got three men who must have a real disregard for human life to plot something like this. Coming up. A remote beauty spot and a vicious murder. An efit, a suspect, and a deadly combination. Most people who hear a voice telling them to kill are going to feel very frightened by it. Very few are going to be willing to act on it. Norfolk. Amid this peaceful, rural backwater, an 83-year-old man goes about his normal morning routine. So this wouldn't have been unlike any other day for Peter Wrighton. He loaded up his red Skoda with his two dogs and they headed off for their daily walk. Quite often he would pick up rolls for lunch to bring home to his wife. She never joined him on the walk because of uh, arthritis, so he would walk the dogs, Gemma and Dylan, in the morning and then come back home for lunch after. But on this day, August the 5th, 2017, Peter Wrighton didn't come home. Just 35 minutes after being caught on CCTV, he was dead, bearing the scars of a horrific attack. A couple out walking their dogs came across Mr Wrighton's body. There was quite a lot of blood around the um, scene. They thought that perhaps he'd been attacked by some sort of wild animal or an animal of some sort because of the severe injuries to his throat. Um, but it soon became quite apparent when a pathologist arrived that uh, these injuries, in fact, had been um, inflicted by a person and by a weapon. The murder of the kindly retired BT engineer caused fear way beyond the village of East Harling. People had no understanding of how this had happened or why this would happen to a member of the local community. It's a crime that's made headlines across the country. But almost a week on, detectives were no nearer to solving it. There's no CCTV to fall back on, no obvious motive. It means gathering every shred of evidence from the scene and getting every possible witness to come forward. It's vital that anybody with any information, uh, no matter how in, in, seemingly insignificant, um, reports that to us. We need the public's help to, to solve this crime. Fellow dog walkers did help, giving details of a stranger they remembered seeing. 
an EFIT was issued by police, prompting a call from an unexpected source. They got the tip off from a former military mental health worker who gave them a suspect, and that's when this whole investigation turned on its head. Now the police had a name, Alex Palmer, an ex-paratrooper with a backstory. Alexander Palmer had been in the army since he was 16 years old and had worked his way all the way up to being a commando. Now he was medically discharged from the military after suffering a head injury. His parents told me that on a night out with his colleagues, he was dragged out of a cab, beaten up, and then his head was left on a curbstone where someone stamped on his head. It was truly one of the most gruesome attacks that you could imagine. And his parents say that ever since that moment happened, he'd completely changed as a person. Discharged, Palmer underwent treatment. He admitted a fascination with knives, with violence, and said he heard voices directing him to kill. People who have traumatic brain injury are far more likely to develop mental health problems. They're more likely to feel angry and irritable. They're more likely to be violent. Alex Palmer had been accepted into the Paras. He'd been through a really tough recruitment process for what is one of the toughest roles in the army. So he'd been assessed as somebody who is fearless, brave, willing to take risks, able to think on his feet and highly intelligent. So imagine how that personality, his core personality, interacts with a very powerful voice telling him to kill people. It may seem a rather odd thing, but he had a particular problem with dog walkers. He didn't like them. Goodness knows why, but he didn't. And he fantasised about stabbing the eyes out of a body to stop it staring at him. And one of the significant injuries to Mr. Wrighton was stab root wounds to his left eye. Police had his name and then his phone number. They were able to carry out a cell site analysis. That put him in the area at the relevant time. Next, police ANPR, automatic number plate recognition, confirmed his route. They were also able to see him drive from Norwich to the area of East Harling and then return. And in the middle of those two journeys, was the window in which Mr. Wrighton was killed. It was enough to bring Palmer in for questioning. Can I get you to introduce yourself, please, with your full name and your date of birth? Uh, Alexander Hobbs Palmer, uh, born 8th the 9th, 93. Thank you. But this would be no ordinary interview. Sometimes he would tell the truth, other times he would not. Palmer claims to have a voice in his head and uh, like an alter ego that he calls uh, Alex uh, with an I. And the police officer is interested in that and uh, he quizzes him. Is there a different Alex? Uh, at times, yes. OK, who's he? He used to manifest himself as a physical hallucination but now it's just a voice. We have a hand gesture there to reinforce it as a physical hallucination. And that gesture is synchronised, which suggests this is a, a credible claim. Is there a different Alex? Uh, at times, yes. OK. We have um, what appears to be a snort or a snigger, followed by pauses, uh, hesitation errs, more pausing. So we already have indications then that there's some kind of um, mental illness involved. And so the police officer continues to ask questions around um, the identity of this different Alex. He doesn't force you to do things or anything like that? No. OK. He seems to be protecting this different Alex, and he seems to um, not use the opportunity that the police officer seems to be affording him to use the other Alex as an excuse or as a scapegoat for that day. Is he still with us? Yes. Is he here today? Yes. Where is he now? What is he 
So we get this firm indication, uh, quite striking, of uh, his ear, he's clicking behind his ear to suggest it's somewhere in this area. So the officer probes further and says, um, where, behind you? He's, th he's there, is he? What, behind you, or...? It's... Yeah, like it's coming from behind me, but also in, in the head. The police officer has assumed this is behind. And he's saying, well, it's sort of behind, but it's mainly inside my head. And so he, he clarifies that up. This adds credibility to his claim that he has voices in his head. That's probably true. Most people who hear a voice telling them to kill are going to feel very frightened by it. Very few are going to be willing to act on it. But here we've got somebody who has been psychologically assessed for his very capability to be a killer if instructed to do so. Detectives had now established Alex Palmer had mental health problems. But was he also capable of murder? Coming up, the watcher, the listener, and the profiler. He's got the motivation, he's got the weapons, he's got the skills. He says no comment with his words, but his body is shouting yes. August 2017. One week after the brutal murder of pensioner Peter Wrighton, Norfolk Police had a suspect. Alex Palmer, 23, matched the e-fit of a man seen walking in the woods near the village of East Harling. And the former paratrooper, who'd been treated for mental health problems, had previously told of his violent fantasies. Tell me about your registration plate, because that's unusual. <laughs> What's the story behind that? Traffic cameras had shown Palmer's car with the unusual license plate number 666 near the murder scene. How, how did you come by that registration plate? My mum got it for my birthday. OK, so is there any significance to the numbers? No, just now. I'm a little devil. <laughs> and she's just... Was that the joke, was yeah. it? Palmer was pretty confident when he started off. He comes across as wanting to help, doing the best he can, and really, it's all rather unfortunate that um, the police have got the wrong man, but he'll do whatever he can to assist them. But in a second interview, eight hours later, cracks began to show. Police showed Palmer an image they'd found on his phone. What sort of knife is it, Alex? His answer is to answer with a question. Uh. One you see there. Uses a question and intonation. Um, so it's a form of evasion. There's also evidence of deliberate pauses and hesitation. So that would all suggest that he's been very, very careful in what he wants to say about the particular knife. But what's its purpose? Uh, to look good. Palmer is careful to stress that this knife is all about appearances rather than function. So we can call this another evasion strategy. He's not wanting to associate it with anything that might link it to being a weapon, especially one that he's used. What's its purpose? To look good. So he's almost inferring that he carries a knife because it's an accessory, almost like something, you know, for your belt or a piece of jewellery or whatever. Unfortunately, there are too many contradictions here from his behaviour that would challenge that claim. First of all, we see a single-sided hand shrug. And just before that, we see a slight shoulder shrug. So at this point, just over his nostrils there, his nose, you can see his head's moving, but also, relative to the wall, you can see the black T-shirt raising probably only five millimetres, half a centimetre. That is a micro, single-sided shoulder shrug. We very, very, very rarely see that when people are telling the truth because it's a subconscious gesture that leaks from the body and then slightly afterwards we get a little turn of the hand, the rotation of the hand, which is the onset of the full gesture of, I've no confidence in what I'm just saying. 
That combination with the low volume gives us confidence that he was carrying a knife for other reasons. Police had also found Palmer's private journals. The thing that strikes me about Alex Palmer's diaries is just how grandiose they are. So he talks about ascending to greatness and achieving glory via murdering somebody. In fact, he says that he thinks people will talk about it for centuries to come. So he's not claiming any political or religious position here, even though he talks about wanting to undermine the foundations of the establishment by disrupting civil peace. He just appears to me as somebody who's delusional. After killing Peter Wrighton, Palmer got rid of his knife and clothes. But police had other evidence. Forensic analysis of Mr. Wrighton's clothing showed traces of DNA which matched Palmer at the lower end of the trouser leg. And once the um, existence of DNA was put to him, uh, the interview somewhat changed. Can you explain to me why your DNA is on that man? Under pressure, his explanation became more desperate. You say you haven't met him. Why is your DNA on him? For instance, I could have lost the hair follicle and caught on his shoe. He's pausing. Uh, we have tongue poke, uh, lip lick, which suggests dry mouth. We have hesitations. So he's, he's showing physiological signs of anxiety at this point. As Palmer's verbal patterns were betraying him, so were his unconscious movements. Can you explain to me why your DNA is on that man? I'm afraid I can't without having So within the matter of uh three, four seconds there, we've got another accumulation of indicators. We see the hand shrug, and we see a head gesture no, micro gesture no. And we also see something else which is interesting. Throughout this interview, he's been manipulating with his hands on his knees and together. But throughout his response here, we see the manipulator stop. So many people think that if you manipulate, you're lying. That's not the case. The research doesn't support that. Deception can be revealed by an increase or a decrease in manipulators. So when you combine those factors, we can conclude here fairly safely that he does know why his DNA is on the dead body, because he was there and he killed him. Although Palmer had mental health issues and heard voices in his head, he never used them as a defense for killing. Throughout the entire questioning, he insisted he had no part in the murder. The police and prosecutors had to decide whether he was responsible for his actions. Just because somebody is suffering from a psychosis doesn't mean that they're not capable of pre-planning and making decisions. I call it rational acts within an irrational story. Alex Palmer was deceptive, there's no doubt about it. He told his girlfriend that he was staying with his brother that day. And he was able to go to the location of the murder without being seen, wait for the right victim and the right opportunity, and he was able to get rid of the murder weapon. It's never been found. So he was able to think this through. He was able to carry out a really very well prepared for, planned for, and well executed attack. You have an interest in knives and weaponry and militaria. You have an interest in dissection and killing. It's not random. Nine days after the murder, Alex Palmer was formally charged. After all his initial attempts to appear cooperative, he finally clammed up. See it from my point of view, where I'm sitting, how does this look? Uh, it looks suspicious. Oh, it's more than suspicious, Alex. I'll ask you again, were you involved in the murder of Peter Wrighton? No comment. 
In February 2018, at Nottingham Crown Court, the trial jury took less than an hour to deliver a unanimous guilty verdict. Alex Palmer was jailed for life with a minimum of 28 years, but that was little comfort for the victim's family. My dad, Peter Wrighton, was viciously attacked and killed whilst walking his dogs. He quite simply was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Palmer's parents, it was revealed, had told health workers their son had been collecting knives and wasn't taking his medication. Their warnings were ignored. The revelations of the evidence relating to the mental health of Alexander Palmer have shocked, astounded and angered us. Evidently, an intelligent person, he was able to take himself off medication and get himself discharged from medical care. Mental health professionals failed him, his family and our family. A Norfolk and Suffolk Health Foundation Trust review admitted weaknesses in its handling of the case. It told this programme it is committed to improving risk assessments, discharge procedures and identifying a lead clinician for every patient. I truly believe that the murder of Peter Wrighton was foreseeable and therefore it was preventable. Here we've got Alex Palmer, a man who is telling people that he intends to kill. Now, you might say that this is, this is all talk, but you've got to be very, very cautious, haven't you? When you've got a man who is saying that and is also highly trained by the military and has a traumatic brain injury. His parents came forward to say that he was stashing knives. So he's got the motivation, he's got the weapons, he's got the skills. The system failed Alex Palmer, and in doing that, it failed Peter Wrighton. <laughs>